this our special webinar on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on supply chain and logistics in Jamaica. I am your chairman for the session and um, I want to welcome you. Um, I think you will be especially welcomed later on to the Mona School of Business and Management. But I want to welcome all the hundreds of you who have registered to this event. First of all, I want to welcome members of CILT, that is the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport, members of MSBM, members of Willat, Women in Logistics and Supply Chain, and just about everybody from the logistics fraternity. This is a great day for us because Willat is spreading its wings in Jamaica, and I believe it's going to be great. I want also to say a special welcome to all the panelists and others who are here, because the truth of the matter is that there is a rumor that logistics is the oldest profession. Um, somebody once said that from the moment God moved, logistics was born. Now you may have ideas about the oldest profession, but I have no clue what you're thinking. But I, in terms of the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport. I think you need to know that CILT has branches all over the world, especially in Africa, especially in Asia. And uh, we happen to be the most recent branch of uh, the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport. And Willet happens to be one of the, the and probably the major forums of the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport. In fact, there are two forums. One is Women in Logistics, and the second one is probably equally mighty or mightier, which if I call it, you will know, it is Gen Next. It is the youth in logistics. Gen Next is, is major. And I want to let you know that um, apart from these two major fora, there are many, in fact, almost dozens of fora, everything from aviation logistics, sea freight logistics, uh, road, road and rail logistics, uh, supply chain and all its various dresses and formation. So in welcoming you to this event, it's not just to women in logistics and transport, it is also to the Chartered Institute. And I would like to say at this time, one of the advantages that we now have is access to all the courses of the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport International through the Mona School of Business and Management. And that should give um, the, the head of education and training in the PSU, Dr. Ingrid Bennett, great joy in hearing that in fact, you out there in industry can get all the training you require. Finally, I want to um, move on. Uh, no, I want to introduce uh, some persons who are here, but who you will not see. I want to introduce Craig, who is the president of the CILT Caribbean. I think he's on the program. Francis, who is vice president and uh, secretary. I want also to introduce Edmund Marsh, who is one of the panelists. He is vice president and treasurer. And Blossom, who is littered throughout this program, who is the chairperson of Willett and also the vice president of the Chartered Inst of CILT Caribbean for short. So, those are faces that you will see. And my really does my final plea to you is please, please, please join CILT Caribbean and you can, can contact any of us and we will point you in the right direction. So welcome and thank you very much. I think that exhausts my time. So I now need to move on to the second item on the agenda. Dr. David McBean is 
a Rhodes Scholar and the Executive Director of Mona School of Business and Management. Um, but we have to give him a very special welcome because the truth of the matter is that we are in his house, or should I say his virtual house. So we thank him for all the facilities and we would like him to tell us what he has in mind for us. However, there are just three caveats that I have about him. First of all, people don't know, he is an engineer by profession, but a CEO by avocation. And thankfully, because of where he sits and because of his eminent background, he is one of the thought leaders in the Mona School of Business and Management, in fact, in the University of the West Indies. So ladies and gentlemen, remarks from David McBean. David? Thank you very much, Franklin. Uh, and welcome all. I'll be brief, um, since I'm sure you aren't here to listen to me. But um, I'd just like to acknowledge our partners. So CILT, thank you very much and Willat, Women in Logistics, and to recognize the principles of that. And also to thank Franklin for really helping to push logistics in a practical way um, through activities such as this, our partnership with the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport, and for providing a bridge between academia and industry. I would also like to take this opportunity to welcome the president of Women in Logistics and Transport Globally, Ghani. I, I apologize for not trying to pronounce both your names out of fear for getting it wrong, but welcome. And she's woken up either very early or very late to be with us. I'd also like to thank all the panelists. And it's very opportune, of course, as you'll hear later, but I'd like to add my voice to this, that logistics is not something which is esoteric or far from us. The recent upheavals have led to the spiraling increases in freight and increases in the basic cost of goods. And if you think, for example, that our customs duties are charged on the cost of the goods, insurance and freight, any substantive change in any of those metrics lead to an escalating increase and of course drives inflation for us. So it's very opportune, we're a trading nation, one of the pillars on which we're looking to build out our economy is on being a, a, a huge transshipment port and a logistics hub. And uh, I look forward to the discussions. So welcome again, especially to our partners from industry and to our students. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, David. Now, we're moving very quickly because I think we want to hear what our uh, the presentation, and I think we want to hear what the panelists will have to tell us about the predicament in which we find ourselves uh, of necessity because we're a part of the world. Dr. Blossom Amelia Nelson, CMILT, is one of our distinguished members of the logistics profession. She's a CEO. Um, I think most important, she's a poet. You may hear some of that today. She's an author. She's a sea freight logistician for many years. More importantly, I think she's a public intellectual and we're very happy that she's bending our mind towards us today. And from what I have, what I know, I have very intimate information that she's a dog person. That is to say, she runs a virtual orphanage for stray dogs, injured dogs, and will spend tons of her money taking them to the vet 
and it makes you sometimes wish that you were a dog. But then again, dogs have their own lives. It gives me great pleasure to ask Blossom, the chairperson of Willet Caribbean, to now make her presentation. Blossom. Thank you very much, Franklin. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's such a pleasure to be here with you. I'm so very pleased to see the number of persons who have registered. I want to say thank you very much to Dr. Matt Bean, firstly, for his very gracious remarks, and um, to really celebrate the MSBM team, excellent professionals and who work together and who leave no stone unturned to make things excellent. Uh, I also want to welcome Diane, who is the global chairperson for Willat. Now you will notice my designation. I have stolen Franklin's position and I'm appearing as chairman of SILT, as chairperson of SILT, and he is also chairman of SILT. Uh, it's just the printer's devil, if there's any such thing in the virtual space. I am chairperson or chairman, I don't mind being called chairman, of Willat Caribbean, that is Women in Logistics and Transport Caribbean. It's my pleasure to just start off the proceedings by setting the stage by looking at whether um, the global supply chain is really holding us to ransom. So I will plunge into sharing screen at this time. Excellent. You know, negotiating Zoom, I will soon have to give people, Dr. McBean, if you're still here, give people special designations, those who have been able to negotiate Zoom, uh, designation behind their name, okay? Um, of course, I have arrived in the middle of the presentation for some reason, so I'm going to try to reverse. And I hope I do better than I do in real life with the reversing business. Here we are. It's a global supply chain holding us to ransom. Uh, what's the supply chain? Because believe it or not, for the majority of people, I would say, it's since this pandemic that they're hearing about logistics and supply chain. And some eminent people have even mastered the pronunciation of logistics. People just um, seem not to be able to comprehend what we mean by logistics. And so um, I would hazard a little um, summary here of what we think logistics is, thanks to Wikipedia. In commerce, a supply chain is a system of organizations, people, activities, information, and resources involved in supplying a product or a service to, to customers. So it is getting products or services to customers. How dependent are we on the global supply chain? <clears throat> uh, the world economy is dependent on a complex network of international trade. We hear about trade agreements, north-south agreements, east-west agreements, um, all of which we benefit from here in the Caribbean. Uh, under these agreements, raw material moves to countries that do processing and refining, processed goods move to manufacturing points, component parts move to plants that manufacture finished goods, time sensitive items like food and medicines need to move quickly through the supply chain. And for any product like a motor car, for example, Component parts of that motor vehicle may have originated in one place and sent somewhere else to be manufactured and somewhere else to be assembled and somewhere else to have the finished goods. So it is a really a complex system that crosses borders, that has geographic significance, that is based on the ability of the world and the countries in the world to function agreements and to function with some integrity. And so we are here in this global space, depending on trade, particularly in the Caribbean, because so much of our raw material, everything we use has a, a, a component that is 
imported. So we are in no way um, self-sufficient in the Caribbean. Small island states are particularly vulnerable because of the level of imports that we have to use to get anything done, even to do our own local manufacture and our own um, agriculture. We need the forks and we need the shovels and we need the fertilizer and we need the oil and we need other fuels and all sorts of things that we have to import so that we can have our goods and services here in Jamaica. The first thing we noticed is that there was shortage of certain items on the shelves, things that we loved, mostly high-end goods we couldn't get again. And some of the other items disappeared. I think um, what I missed first was ceramic flower pots because I'm an ardent gardener. And I couldn't understand why I was only seeing plastic pots until I realized that ceramic uh, flower pots come from the Far East and they just weren't getting here, they weren't a pri priority. And as Dr. McBean mentioned, the prices just started to rise. I mean, the rise in prices in, this, in, in the supermarkets is just absolutely incredible week after week. And so we saw the inflation targets being blown and some concern uh, about inflation in the country generally, all of which goes right back to supply chain I'm not sure if the strategy is being employed by the Bank of Jamaica will address this, but that's for another webinar. Then we had a slow production because people couldn't get raw materials. And in addition to the fact that they couldn't get raw materials, they had lockdowns and work from home and all sorts of disruptions for the labor force. So um, you know, forcing production and production really slowed down and some companies found themselves underwater, some manufacturers. We have Lloyd Piston, who is president of the Chamber of Commerce coming on as part of the panel. I'm sure he will um, enlighten us more on this. As I said, we have difficulty in getting raw materials. And um, I also noticed particularly a slowdown in the delivery of online purchases. As a matter of fact, um, sometimes when you order stuff, it was no longer in stock and they didn't know. I and mean, you have to get a refund, which took forever, and um, have to reorder. And some people were um, experiencing reduced inventory. And I said to myself, so if the goods are social distancing on the supermarket shelves, because they were all spaced out. So... This is to just reconfirm the point that world trade connects us. And you'll see those red lines that most of the trade is in the Northern Hemisphere and the North Atlantic and the Pacific. Those are the heavy trade routes. And the, the two canals, the Panama Canal and the Suez Canal are key areas and vulnerable points in this trade, trade routes, most of which is by sea with the um, super uh, ships with large container loads moving from port to port, moving raw material, finished goods, and, and agricultural products and food items. So it is a very complex system. The global supply chain and is sophisticated. It, it involves trillions of dollars in numerous currencies. And all of those currencies have to be converted um, to serve cross-border needs, and they have to be central clearing houses for, um, for these currencies. It, uh, the global supply chain is the linchpin of commerce, manufacture, distribution, and services. And we don't often think of services as part of the global supply chain. As a matter of fact, that is not top of mind at all, the fact that services are part of the global supply chain. Um, so we find that it is integrally involved in the movement of capital through our global financial systems, because uh, people people have to be financed. You have to you have to upfront money, and you have to um, make sure that you provide enough capital and and look at the level of returns. It has a lot to do with the stock market, and um, people buying shares. Because of the protected activity, it has to be forward, forward buying, all sorts of complex things. 
So the global supply chain is an integral part of the health of our economies. Okay, I need to move to the next slide and my computer is not moving. There we go. So it is estimated that there are over 450 million persons working in the global supply chain worldwide. And um, I think we don't even consider some of the people who are working in the global supply chain. They probably don't even know that they're working in the global supply chain. So lockdowns, layoffs, and job losses have caused a deterioration in the efficiency of the global supply chain. And because the, of the speed and the complexity of the disruptions which occur in major developed countries, this created a ripple effect on the entire global system. It was almost like a, a domino effect. Um, if you think of, of airlines lined up on the tarmac and it is being directed by the tower and one taking off one after the other with, with a few minutes in between and one of those aircraft can't take off and then the entire um, projected activity is disrupted and chaos ensues if you're not careful. So um, it is the same thing that happened when layoffs and job losses and um, production was stymied and ships couldn't leave and then they all left together and then they arrived at the port one after the other and the port couldn't take the, the, um, the load. So the wounds to the global supply chain have been significant. And these have to be analyzed and solutions have to be found to mitigate against such risk in the future. And this is one of the reasons why we're having this webinar because Willard is committed to building professionalism in the logistics and supply chain sector, transport sector, and also to build the skills of women to provide these services. This is just a graphic representation of what happens in the global um, supply chain. I think you've all got it. We have people here who are experienced logisticians and you go from customer to, to, to customer service, to ordering material, you get materials and material schedule. You have precious orders have to be approved and it goes on right down until you get um, into warehouses um, and shipping depots and to the customer. So it is a horizontal complexity and complexity. And all of it has to be, all of it has to link together and work like clubs in a wheel. So let us look at some world trade statistics, 2019 to 2021. World merchandise and trade volumes declined, actually declined in 2019, but that was due to economic factors. Uh, um, weak GDP growth and trade tensions. There were the trade tensions between, largely between US and China, because the world is largely dependent on primary goods produced by China, and that can create a problem. So 2019 was not necessarily a very good year. So when COVID hit in 2020, um, we found that uh, export orders for manufacturing and services uh, fell sharply in, in the first and second quarter. And it was just the low GDP, growth in GDP, and the pandemic uh, created a perfect storm right there. And we find that in 2020, as well, world trade in manufactured goods declined by 18% in the second quarter. But the interesting thing is that by 2021, world trade in manufacturing and agriculture was recovering strongly. But I would say, for some reason, we're not really feeling the impact of that, although we may be getting an inkling, we'll hear later from the panel. And the trade in services slowed only partially. They only showed only partial recovery 
in 2021. You may be wondering what these services are, but we have things like project management. We have specialists who have to provide services across the globe. We have consultants, we have consultancy projects. We have the whole transfer of knowledge, that's services, data, data mining, data interpretation, all of those things are services that we provide to support the hardcore manufacturing. Overall, recovery in 2021 was strong, but it was uneven. And I'm sure that we will agree with the uneven part of it. So what went wrong? Why did all this happen? In um, January 2020, the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 to be a pandemic. And we all remember that. We remember the hesitancy, but we also remember when it had happened. And this pandemic triggered what I would call the greatest disruption of the global supply chain in peacetime. The only other time when we see that type of disruption in the supply chain is during a world war. So we had this disruption of the supply chain and it was sudden. It was a shock to the system. And the main problem is that there was no unified global response because countries were not really prepared for this and didn't know how to respond. And then they had political issues because governments were wary about how they disrupted um, citizens' practices and what impact this would have on their economy. And uh, each, each nation state chose its own path. And most of us, um, experienced lockdowns, it has interrupted production, work from home was instituted, but nobody was trained to work from home. So that was a, 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 another issue. And companies were not, management was not streamlined with the sort of technological applications that would enable them to effectively um, monitor people who work from home. And, and keep production at a certain level. And we see that in our public service now, we still have that impact where people are not at work and when they're not at work is as if they're not at work and you really can't get through with what you need to get done. So uh, many workers were laid off, others dismissed, others lost their jobs. We see, for example, in the United States, the government uh, had to give them support and it turned out for many people that the support given by the government was better than when they were working. So we have a problem now, some people not wanting to go back to work. Entertainment and food services took a downturn and that is a large part of our, our economy locally and worldwide. And that was um, a real blow to the um, local economies. Health services were stressed beyond imagination. Uh, we, we, we saw where, where um, hospitals couldn't cope with persons who were ill. And we'll remember what seemed like a hundred years ago when Italy had to make decisions about who they should offer treatment to. And some people were just left untreated. So how do we go about reconfiguring our logistics now? Major ports such as in China and the USA have been severely congested and unable to process the backlog of vessels um, needing to discharge their cargoes. And we, we've seen so many news items about this. Delivery schedules had to be reworked, but the problem was far from solved as ports now had to provide adequate labor to man additional working hours. You don't just say we're going to go 24 seven if you're not a port that is accustomed to going 24 seven. You're not just saying that we have to double the manpower because you just don't have the manpower. And people not trained and, and working on a port is dangerous activity. And trucking and rail services were inadequate to meet the overland delivery demand because when everything piles up, you don't have enough trucks to move them and you don't have enough drivers for the trucks. And the drivers decided that this was a good time to complain about how, how poor their salaries were and how bad their working conditions were. And they had some leverage there to get um, more attractive salaries. And so some countries use strategies like the USA and Australia, 
where there was thought of bringing in drivers from the army. It was as bad as that to get delivery trucks going so we could clear the ports. We, I have to mention COVID-19 because that is when the whole business of supply chain and logistics really blew up in everybody's face, right? The vaccine. Um, formerly, we never heard of how vaccines got here. You just go and get vaccinated. But the world became aware of the significance of the supply chain when the matter of vaccinations became a priority. And problems centered, centered around the production of vaccines. You have to manufacture them, which means you have to get the raw materials. So you have the same supply chain issue. And sourcing it, who has it? Where can we get some? You remember those days? We had to beg, borrow, and plead to get the first set of vaccinations. And then which kind of vaccination should you get? What brand? And then these vaccinations had to be approved. Partial approval, what is that? Are they safe? And then how are they going to get here? I think because of the time sensitivity of the items, it is largely by air. But then you have to have a local distribution network. And if you have to establish a cold chain, but not keeping it at a certain temperature, you have to have refrigerated trucks. And if you have refrigerated trucks, when you take the vaccine to clinics, do they have refrigerated anything at clinics, particularly in our rural areas, to keep vaccines? So we find that when one Sam you open vaccines at many of these clinics, you have to vaccinate as many people as possible to make sure that you use up the entire thing because you can't, um, you don't have anywhere to put it after that and it won't be of any use. And then health professionals were not aware really of logistics and supply chain issues and how to, how to manage distribution and how to manage delivery and how to manage the conditions under which these things are kept. Um, so we find that the COVID-19 vaccine has made everybody aware of logistics and supply chain. And this is our, our, our opportunity to train the nation. The Institute of Supply Chain Management has some data on the global impact, where it says that 75% of businesses saw disruptions in their supply chain. And um, I am sure our panel will concur with this. 62% cited delays in receiving goods. 52% had difficulties in receiving goods from China. And Don and Bradstreet reported that 5 million companies in tier two supplies experienced disruption in their supply chains. So the, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on logistics and supply chain was, was, has been immense. Now we have to, for our own survival, maintain the viability of the global supply chain. So a viable global supply chain, a viable supply chain is sustainable. That means that it can survive beyond initial shocks. It just doesn't collapse at the first hurricane we have or the first earthquake or the first port that has to be closed. It is agile. It can adopt to these, adapt to these shocks and find solutions. The supply chain can. It is resilient because the level of resources are enough to sustain the supply chain operation while it is being reorganized. And the key decision makers are knowledgeable. They know what they are doing. So therefore, a viable supply chain is sustainable, it is agile, it is resilient, and it's managed by people who know what they are doing. And that is one of the problems we have in logistics, finding competent people who have a worldview and who understand the linkages and who can manipulate all the variables that they face daily. Um, the current response to supply chain issues, we we'll see where President Biden has called for a global response at the um, recent 
G20 conference. And he did put that on the agenda. And the conference agreed that there was need to strengthen and diversify the entire supply chain ecosystem. And we can, we know what the, um, the political issues are um, behind this. It's not just because of COVID-19. We see where China is carving out more and more of the trade system for itself. Uh, we see Russia holding Germany to ransom over oil pipelines. We see that the Middle East and, and US hegemony in these areas is declining and um, that OPEC can do pretty much as it likes. Countries need to reduce over-dependence on one source of raw materials. This is what um, the Global Forum is now agreeing. For example, Australia recognizes its vulnerability to China for critical raw material, the materials that it uses for its water supplies, for its energy, for its manufacture. And those countries who have rare minerals like lithium and chromium and uranium, we're talking about Canada, we're talking about China, we're talking about Brazil. All of those countries now have a lot of leverage on what goes on in the world. Um, so the need now is, that it is recognized now that there's need for greater global cooperation to rebalance this over dependence on any one source of raw material. And um, that is very heartening. Of course, you know, it's a great distance from the, for, from the recognition to taking action, but we mustn't give up hope. So the US now has committed to streamlining its stockpiling efforts so that it can give a quick response whenever you have a logistics crisis. And um, they also recognize that Latin America also has issues and they're dependent on Latin America and Central America. So the decision is to provide technological assistance to Mexico and Central America that will alleviate bottlenecks. So how do we look at future viability? What strategies do we have in place for future viability? We need to strengthen the ability to predict disruptions using technology-based analytic tools and adjust routing and scheduling accordingly. So we have to set up a series of indicators. We probably will have to use artificial and um, intelligence that's going to um, say to us and make predictions, right? So that we can understand when we're going to have run into trouble. <clears throat> we have to intensify research, which means that we have to ask appropriate questions and we have, have to craft solutions. We cannot just leave this to political decisions and the exigencies of the political situation. It is too costly and it is too dangerous to the livelihoods of everybody. And we have to increase shared information across borders. We have to know what is going on from one jurisdiction to another, what issues they're having, where they're likely to be shortages, where they're likely to be problems. And we need greater transparency in the operation of large service providers who have to disclose information that will impact our lives going forward. And as I said, the focus has to be on the use of technology and technological applications. We also find that government and the private sector have to work together in stronger partnerships. Um, I, I noticed during our pandemic that the, private, the government was depending on the private sector to get vaccine and the private sector was depending on the government to get vaccine. And, the, and to say nothing of <coughs> glo gloves, <coughs> we had to get gloves and, and the hazard wear and all sorts of things that nobody knew exactly who was to buy it. So we have to do that. Um, we have to know these things going forward. We have to expand court capacity. We have to um, ensure that courts can take a shock. Trans Overland transport capability has to be diversified and um, the capability increased, routing equipment, personnel, more training for people in that field. Uh, 
some countries are already moving to reduce their dependence on offshore suppliers. And some countries have already started reshoring, bringing back their manufacturer home, home and opening up reserves where they can provide their own raw materials. As a matter of fact, this I see is a threat to globalization because I think the whole concept of, of the global space for trade and exchange of goods is going to be um, examined where countries are going to want to have greater independence rather than depending on resources from other areas. Uh, we have to increase end-to-end -end security and safety for the supply chain. And the safety of databases is very important because there's a lot of hacking of very important information that have significant financial consequences. We also need increased public information on the significance of the global supply chain. Here in Jamaica, we need to be particularly aware of how vulnerable we are, and we need to have contingencies as to how we're going to manage. Um, because remember, all our power, all our oil is imported, so we need to be able to establish greater self-sufficiency. And of course, all of this can't be done without increased professional and technical training in logistics and supply chain. Hence the utility now of establishing the Chartered Institute and Willett. I want to thank you. And as I said, I'm saying think possibility. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And here I am as chairman of Willard Caribbean, so we've got that. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Blossom. Applause. I think, Blossom, you have, you have absolutely set the agenda for the panel discussion. I think you have brooded a number of issues that are going to have to be squarely addressed by our excellent uh, panel and uh, the moderator. And that, however, is a, is a job for somebody else. And I would like very quickly to introduce Dr. Yolanda Silvera, who is also part of the MSBM. But Yolanda has worked in industry for probably about two or more decades in manufacturing, in mining, in financial services. Um, and throughout the years, she has worked, in fact, in academia as well, latterly. She has worked in all these industries with a focus on assisting companies to increase their productivity, increase their efficiency, increase their production, and in the area of project management, supply chain, and logistics. So Yolande the, is now going to introduce the moderator and the panelists who you see all before you. Yolande? Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Johnston, and thank you to our audience um, online, on YouTube, wherever you are. Thank you for joining us. Before I introduce the panelists, just to put our webinar tonight um, in context, just as Dr. Blossom Amelia Nelson just did, I will quote, I, I'm not sure how many of you saw a presentation done by Mr. Webby on the business, um, business day presentation last night. And I quote, he said, the freight rates from China pre-COVID-19 was US 2,500 per 20 foot container. It is now US $15,000 per container. What we're talking about is a significant increase in food inflation. Now that's six times the rate is their current paying for um, container shipment is six times what they were paying prior to COVID. And that puts us in context as to what we are talking about tonight. We have expert panelists, some experts here that will be sharing with you their perspective on this topic of COVID and its impact on logistics and supply chain management. Our moderator for tonight is none other than Mr. Lani May, who is also a supply chain professional with over 15 years experience. He has worked mostly in strategic leadership and planning, 
business operation, um, management, distribution, and procurement. And in the last couple of years, I spent his time working as a consultant for companies in this area. That's our moderator. Our first panelist that you'll see is Mr. Marsh. Mr. Marsh is a consultant um, in the area of logistics and supply chain. He's also an adjunct lecturer here at Muna School of Business and Management and one of my good friends. Um, he has a number of years also of experience in logistics and supply chain and has worked across the world in the United Kingdom, USA and Caribbean and in the Caribbean. He has worked in areas such as food manufacturing and distribution, uh, management, global consulting, and lastly, he was recently at the port prior to his retirement. That's our Kingston Wharf port. Next up on our panel, our list of panelists is Mrs. Cohen. Mrs. Cohen is the CEO of Lillian's Limited, and for those of us that buy our packages of goat meat and oxtail and see the Lillian brand, that's her. So she's coming to us with years of experience in the supply chain area and as a business owner to share her insight. Our company provides the highest quality meats, fish grains and pickled meats to Jamaican consumers at highly competitive prices. She's a graduate of Spelman College and she's very passionate about making the best, helping people to make the best of their God-given talent. She dedicates most of her time outside of work, being a wife and mother to her two children. We also have on our panel tonight, Mr. Lloyd Distant, who is the chairman for Jamaica Chamber of Commerce. He's also currently the executive chairman for Casa de Jamaica and Reggae Vibes Limited, which houses several retail concessionaires across Norman Manley International Airport and Sangster International Airport. He's an accomplished business leader with a strong finance and technology background, coupled with over three decades of demonstrated leadership in various areas focusing on sales and profit. Um, he mentors a, a number of persons in industry and leading companies, and we thank him for being, sparing some time to be here with us tonight. Also on our panel is Mr. Earl Stewart, who is Director of Research and Planning at the Jamaica Customs Agency. He is a results-oriented individual with a passion and drive for excellence. Mr. Stewart Jr. is currently the Director, as I said before, for Planning and Research at the Jamaica Customs Agency's expertise lies in the areas of strategic management, capacity development, information systems management and research, and he's an outstanding graduate of the University of Technology. Okay, my alma mater, of course, achieving a master's degree in business administration, focusing on information systems. Um, he was awarded for outstanding performance in 20, 2010 for his area of specialization. He has worked in ver at various um, areas in Jamaica, at the Planning Institute of Jamaica. Um, he also served for four consecutive terms on the Jamaica Bi Biennial Dias Diaspora Conference. And lastly, but surely not least, is Mr. Ian Kelly, who is the Chief Financial Officer of Derriman Traders. He is an adept finance and risk management professional. Um, he has senior level experience in treasury, asset management, corresponding banking, et cetera. He has served, um, he, sorry, he serves as Group Chief Financial Officer for Derriman Trading and Divisional Director for SAMPARS. He's a certified public accountant and holds both a Bachelor's and Master of Science degree in accounting from the University of West Indies. He also completed his Executive Development Program at Wharton Business School, the University of Pennsylvania. He sits on a number of boards here in Jamaica the Ty Dixon Primary School, Reggae Marathon, Postrich Group of Companies, Caribbean Flavors and Fragrances Limited, among others. And we thank them all for making the time to be with us tonight, or this evening, sorry, to share with us their experiences and knowledge in the area of logistics and supply chain, and of course, focusing on COVID. So I now hand over to our moderator, Mr. Lani Main.
Mr. Main, unmute. I think you're muted. Okay, great. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Over to you. Good. So, pleasant, good evening, everyone. It's indeed a pleasure moderating this panel discussion. Very timely topic, interesting topic um, to look at as a small developing state. And uh, as we heard earlier, a very lucid and erudite presentation from our keynote speaker. And uh, this panel discussion promised to be nothing less. All right. As Lady Silvera mentioned that we have a very able team of panelists, what you'll consider giants in the industry, coming to us with a wealth of knowledge and experience on the subject matter. And uh, this is going to be an opportunity where as audience in virtual world, we can engage in terms of the topic to have very robust discussions. So I want you to start preparing in terms of your questions and your concerns, because we have a team of experts that will be able to address same. Now, industry experts have termed this time period what they call a perfect storm. And you would have heard our keynote speaker spoke about the high percentage of input in our production process that is imported, um, our focus on cheaper export that has led to longer lead time due to more offshoring um, sourcing, and the quadruple effect in terms of freight costs and the availability of containers, um, coupled with the hike in raw material costs and the consistent devaluation in our currency. So indeed, these are interesting times for our world and indeed Jamaica. And how we maneuver um, within this time is gonna be very, very crucial. So therefore, we're having this interested um, discussion to gain some perspective um, as we move forward in these times that are considered new norms. And just before we engage in the interactive um, part of this panel discussion, we want to allow our panelists an opportunity to share with us a little about their industry and the role that same plays in the supply chain and logistics and how has the pandemic impacted uh, their operation. Now, I grew up with my grandmother, all right, and uh, I'm a principled man, and we have one rose among the thorns, all right, in the person of Mrs. Andrea Cohen, CEO of Lillian. I want to start out with Mrs. Cohen to just give us your perspective um, on same. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you for having me. I think Blossoms really was very um, effective in setting the platform for some of the challenges that we're experiencing in trade. Um, as a small business owner, one of the challenges we face is, of course, trying to time your supply needs with the demands of your consumer. And of course, you have to fund it. So these things are changing daily and finding funds at a cost that, will, that you can project and plan for is becoming more and more difficult. Local goods go up, I would say, We've seen price increases in local production. I would say maybe every three to four weeks. And that's based on the cost of goods and the sourcing of it from you know, the source. So it is more and more difficult for us all to plan and project. But what it means for persons like myself in the trade is that we have to have a very good relationship with all areas of the trade our suppliers, our bankers, and our customers who have to be you know, paying for goods on time and so on. So I think from my seat, uh, we all thought things were difficult before, but if you are not resourceful and honorable, you're gonna have a very hard time going forward.
I believe your, your mic thanks, is muted. Thanks yeah. very much, uh, Mrs. Cohen. We want to move on to get the perspective of Mr. Ian Kelly, CFO of Dermont Trading. Mr. Kelly, over to you. Well, again, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this forum. And I must say that it is, in, is in, it is in this time that you have to be resourceful and you have to learn the art of pivoting. The fact is the global logistics has created is within our group. Our group comprises of manufacturing, um, food distribution, and we also operate in different markets, both here in Jamaica and in the United United States. The fact is, within the United States, the issue is real. However, because of the fact that the transportation system is just is much much more robust than Jamaica, at least the impact of interstate linkages will allow you to be able to at least be be in a position to provide many of your final products to the consumers that you serve. In addition to that the ability for you to, to, to make adjustments to prices immediately is even much more accepted than in markets such as Jamaica. Um, operating within our manufacturing spaces where not only are you sometimes have to be prepaying and you are not able to get those raw, essential raw materials on time, which creates that adage issue for your other uh, manufacturers who are rely on, rely on you. The fact is you are seeing where in instances critical raw materials which are applicable to your manufacturers would have gone up by 100% in very short period of time. And as a result of that, you are now forced to make changes and those changes um, creates that multiplier effect for your other manufacturers who relies on you and also the end consumers. In addition to that, the delays that 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 you would have make payments at times for most of, of, of the items that we use in 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 the process, um, and that creates issue for 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 your your clients that you serve, and you also will also have to 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 put that within the context that um, we do not operate in a in a state where our functional currency and our reporting currencies are the same. So that added risk creates a major cost um, implication for you. So the, 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 the fact with many of the challenges that we experience is that we have to be very, very close to the relationships that we have, and also that our planning and also carrying cost for raw materials has to be as, as, as increased and has to be spot on, given um, the, the, the four levels of forward planning that you will have to do. And even with that, um, price increase, delays, unable to, 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 to get supplies from your regular custom because they are still having these challenges, continues to create that problem. And uh, we're not seeing where it is getting any better. Okay, thanks much for that, Mr. Ian Kelly. And I just want to remind the panelists to keep their videos on so persons can be put in face the name um, as we engage with them, all right? Uh, we want to move on to getting the perspective of a very important agent in the whole supply chain and logistics. And with us today, Mr. Earl Stewart, from the Jamaican Custom. Uh, Director Earl Stewart, could you just share your perspective at this time? Uh, thank you, sir, uh, moderator. Um, let me thank you for inviting me and more so inviting the Jamaica Customs Agency to share in this webinar. Um, let me bring greetings on behalf of the CEO, Commissioner of Customs, Mrs. Velma Ricketts Walker, and the Customs family um, for inviting us here. So very timely is this webinar to, to really look at the impact that COVID-19 is causing on the, the supply chain. Um, 
uh, as customs, if we look at it, we, we looked at it on the frontier of how has COVID-19 affected our core function here is uh, border protection, revenue collection, and trade facilitation, and also our institutional capacity uh, development and sustainability. Um, I like to go to the numbers. When we looked at um, the COVID-19 here, uh, so we had the fiscal year 2020, 2021, with respect to the revenue collection, we experienced a 20% uh, decline or fallout with respect to revenue collected versus our previous year, uh, which was in the sum of 47.902 billion and such forth. So we also took a hit with respect to COVID-19. Uh, we, we looked from the standpoint of, you know, what affected these, and I'll try to be very quick here, we experienced decline with respect to containerized uh, shipments being imported. So there was a 10% decline with respect to the number of containerized shipments, 4% uh, decline with respect to when you look at the, the volume in terms of weight. Uh, and when I looked at exports, there was also a 6% decline. So both import and export, we were seeing decline in terms of the, the volume of trade for, for Jamaica. Looking at the trade facilitation side of things, what was good for us, because you know you look at impact, not just from the negative, but also from the positive standpoint, uh, the agency was able to, to maintain its service delivery with respect to its documentary process. So how efficient were we processing shipments you know, to, to meet our customers or stakeholder needs? And so, we have seen where we have moved from you know, an 80% on average shipments processed within our charter standard of 20 hours to where we are seeing a 10% increase, 90% of shipments being processed within that, that 20 hours. So what's the cause of that? Greater monitoring and the agility of the agency to utilize technology. And I, and I heard uh, Dr. Amelia Nelson went there with respect to the need now for the utilization of technology. So from the standpoint of the, the foresight of the implementation of Asikuda World, uh, the port community system, and we have JSWIFT who has started and is growing in terms of its implementation, the agency was able to be resilient in, and continue to provide services uh, to our clients and customers. Notwithstanding, when we look at the border protection side, uh, there were some challenges uh, with respect to, you know, smugglers continuing to penetrate the border. So what are we seeing with respect to the data? An average monthly, 90, 93, in terms of an average 93 uh, contraband seizures were, were, were detected and seized and with respect to narcotics specifically, that's 53 narcotic seizures on average uh, a month. That, you know, when you look at it, it, it calls for more resources. It calls for uh, greater utilization of risk management, which the agency has responded in terms of, you know, aiding the protection of society and Jamaica. Okay, thanks, Nicholas. Um, Sir Stewart for sharing with us that perspective from the Jamaica customs. And we want to remind our audience in virtual land that this is gonna be the time that we're gonna be having robust discussions and engagement. So we want you to start feeling your questions, your concerns regarding this topic in the chat. All right, because we're gonna be coming to that time very soon. We have two more perspectives that we just want to hear before we get into the question and answer session. Um, so next, representing the wider business community, we have Mr. Lloyd Distance, Chairman of the Jamaica Chambers of Commons. We're just gonna ask you for a quick feedback as we get into the other discussions, Sir Distance. Thank you so much uh, for that kind introduction and the opportunity to share. I mean, thank you, Mona School of and of course, we let as well. Uh, from the, you know, I'm not going to say a lot different from what you've probably heard thus far. 
certainly from the chamber's perspective, um, earlier this year, uh, and probably more so just around summer in June, we issued a series of statements because of the engagement that came to us through our members. Uh, you know, it was very clear, shipping costs were rising r quite sharply. Uh, there was quite fierce competition for ocean freight capa capacity across the region and just even coming into Jamaica. And we saw these increased shipping costs just skyrocketing for something that was 3,500 late last year, earlier this year, in, in terms of container rates coming in from China. Uh, the rates were already at 14,000 and by the time we got into the late summer, we were somewhere in the region of $20,000 per container. So the, the impact that this had on the ability for many businesses, and this is both uh, traders, so these are people, who, you know, they bring in an item to resell, and whether that's electronics or other items, uh, you know, we, we looked at lumber prices, steel prices, wheat and soybean prices, or even, uh, as we heard earlier from at least one of the other panelists, just bringing in inputs for the manufacturing process, those prices rose at a quite shocking rate. We would have engaged at the time with the Minister of Finance along with the Shipping Association to identify ways in which we could probably identify some relief for these businesses, for all businesses, persons bringing items in. We were not successful in, in that regard thus far, and we are of the view that the minister will continue to track and look at it and will continue to advocate for a change or a different approach uh, for the pricing that's coming for items coming in through customs. But we continue to see the rise and we don't believe it's the rise in global shipping costs and we don't believe that that is going to disappear. Uh, the, the imbalances that started in the first place, either imbalances in production, imbalances in demand for goods, uh, with countries locking down and opening up at different times, that will continue to take place unabated. Uh, th there are really few alternatives to ocean freight coming into Jamaica. Of course, you can always fly some items, you can always just utilize air freight, but the cost again becomes prohibitive, particularly in our market where we're now hearing uh, inflation rates of 8%. Uh, I know some person will, de will debate and say that they've seen much higher rates. But again, just the impact of that on the businesses and the ability to price will continue. Um, we are almost at the end of 2021 and we're still seeing an unbalanced recovery. And that is likely to run into uh, certainly the first quarter, maybe even the second quarter of next year. And on top of all of that, we continue to see port congestions and closures that create delays. And those delays, of course, create increases in pricing or costs. To the business persons and you know i'm trying to summarize this very quickly but you know there's so many of these points that are very much at the heart of what businesses are seeing and experiencing and we are hearing it from the broader business community all across jamaica all industries and all sizes of businesses as well so i'll put that on the table we'll continue to fight for some improvement uh, and look forward to participating somewhere in the discourse all right thanks very much Mr. Lloyd Distance. And it's very good that we have our Director of Customs um, with us today. So I'm sure he heard your feedback about um, the cost of freight. And I'm sure you might have good news to share with us how customs will help us, uh, the business community, in managing that. So last but certainly not least, um, closing out our very expert um, team of panelists, we have our consultant on logistics and supply chain. Uh, Mr. Edmund Marsh. Um, go ahead and share with us, uh, Sir Marsh, on this very important topic. Okay, sir. Thank you, Lenny. Good to see you. And um, so many of the, the panelists, um, good to see you again. Uh, one quick correction that Yolanda mentioned that I was uh, a, member of, a former member of the Kingston Wharf team. That's not quite you know, true. I actually was the vice president of the Port Authority which is on the other side of the fence. And, um, you know, I'm going to speak very quickly about ocean freight that's been in the news so much. And, you know, we have heard so much of it, you know, so far in the discussion. Uh, I mean, Blossom took away most of the points I was going to make. But anyway, I will try to 
to, to in fact, it made me to focus on some other things. But we know what's going on in ocean freight. Um, labor sh between labor shortages, congestion at some very, very key ports, namely the US um, West Coast ports, as well as in Europe, lack of space on vessels, containers that are available are in the wrong place. Um, ocean freight, you know, has really been been a major problem of late, um, coupled with the fact that we have seen now where recovery have been taking place. And I heard um, a couple, twice I've heard it before, just this evening about the perfect storm. That's again, that's what is helping to cause some sort of problems. Another one that um, that is very common now is that ship crew, the, the seafarers, the captains are unable to rotate their their, their crews due to the fact that um, the can Delta variant was so prevalent, countries were stopping them from coming in. So that's another issue that has made added some complication. Um, despite all, all these problems, there is no a big demand for ocean freight, especially from the Asia Pacific region to the US and to Europe. And um, but the thing is, the problem is the manufacturers in China don't have the containers. You know, they're in the wrong place. So we have heard about the skyrocketing um, freight costs and between six times, 10 times, 20, you know, all these figures have been banded about. And some people said the situation will get worse. And, you know, based on the fact that there's pent up demand, you know, there's still there, border controls and restrictions still exist. Um, we don't have a global passport, vaccine passport yet. There's still, you know, discussions about that. And, you know, the, the bottlenecks are everywhere in the supply chain and as a result, and that is causing some disruption. Quickly, where are we today? Uh, a bit of good news, a bit, a bit, very, very. I was watching a CNBC report which suggested that, or indicated the headline was, the worst is over for global supply chains. But here what? This has been quoted by the um, president of the International Chamber of Shipping. And they feel that things are getting better, uh, but over the next 24 to 36 months, it should start. You won't, things will continue, but um, won't get much better over in the short term. Um, Drury and, and the, 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 the good news that they're talking about. And here's this, I'll read it from Drury, Maritime Research. You know, it does consulting and uh, does research on freight rates and so on. That they saw a 0.5% low rate in the week of November 18. <laughs> and I guess that is a rare hope. But there are still many problems within the shipping industry. And uh, for example, but there are some some the, the amazing thing is that the shipping lines they are, are their best performance they have been making super profits of late in fact even our local kingston wall recently in their most recent quarter um revenues were up 20 percent profits are up net income up about 28 percent their terminal operations business was up 19 percent and um logistics 27 percent so it's not all doom and gloom, um, you know, just go and put it on by Port Authority, hot for a minute, former hot. Cruise industry is a major linchpin of our, our economy. And there is no, you know, oppressing some, you know, good opportunities seem to be ar arising there. So something to look forward to. In summary, at best, global supply chains, although bless or might, you know, did give a very bleak picture about it. It's still a very active way of lowering costs and a way to spur innovation. But the, the, the pandemic, as you know, has really put some challenges to that. All right. Thanks, Lenny. Okay, great. Thanks much. And I think the stage has been further set for us to have some very meaningful dialogue already. I'm seeing questions in the chat and I want to go to our first question. Remember that we can pose our questions in the chat. We have 
a team of experts that will provide answers um, to same. So the first question I'm seeing here is from uh, Tracy Genius Webby. Um, good evening, do import importers anticipate a major food shortage in the long term? And I want to pose that question to our CFO of Dermont Trading, uh, which is big on distribution of consumer items. Um, Sir Kelly, could you just go ahead um, in response to that question? Very good question, Tracy. From, from where I sit, I do not think that there will be a, a, a shortage. There may be delays and there may be some product that will not be available real time and in the quantities that it is normally has been. Um, but I think that given that many distributors have no identified that this is an issue, what, what, what we have been doing, we have been diversifying our sources and I've been looking into different markets other than the traditional markets that many of us usually use as our former sources. So I really don't think, think, think that, that we'll have a shortage. For certainty, there will be price increases in, in the very short, continue to be price increases in the short run. All right, great. Thanks much for, for that input and feedback there, um, Sir Kelly. And I, I was reminded, um, there's a saying that says, in every challenge, there's opportunities. And in every opportunity, there are challenges. And we're definitely living in some very interesting times and we have to find the way of surviving. Um, I want to hear um, further though, on this from uh, um, Mr. Distance. Um, what, is, what are you hearing um, from the wider um, business um, world on this question of food shortage, possible food shortage? Are you hearing any intelligence coming from your side? So what I've been hearing actually aligns with the comments made by, by Ian. Uh, the chamber has within its body a subcommittee called retailers wholesalers and distributors. The, the last meeting they had was probably about three weeks ago. And this matter was discussed. Uh, the, the view is that uh, everybody's taking the necessary steps to identify alternate markets. Uh, we are no, no longer as reliant on China for the items that people are seeking. So you, we'll now start to see some goods from Mexico, from other Latin American and Central American countries come into the market. Some will be at almost an equivalent price as if we were bringing it in from China at, an es at the escalated cost that we're seeing from the shipping from that uh, hemisphere. Um, but uh, generally speaking, uh, we're seeing retailers, we're seeing wholesalers and distributors pivot, identify alternate markets, uh, alternate sources and begin to fill the gaps. Uh, we're seeing a smattering of opportunities come out, and, and that's part of the question you asked, is that persons are actually looking to other Caribbean markets and saying, well, if we're having this shortage, their challenge because of scale and scope would be even more exasperating for them than we are experiencing here in Jamaica. So there are a few of our uh, entrepreneurs in Jamaica who are actually looking to other Caribbean markets, smaller markets to take advantage of the uh, opportunities that are created from the challenges. Okay, thanks much, uh, Sir Distance. And seeing the questions um, coming very fast and furious. So another question, uh, many Jamaican firms within the fast moving consumer goods era uh, have been building up safety stock as a buffer against uncertain um, demand and supply. What are some of the negative financial implications of this action? And how can firms manage the trade-offs and minimize the erosion of margin? Uh, I want to put that question um, to Mrs. Andrea Cohen, CEO of Lilians. Lilians, uh, could you just share some perspective on that question, uh, Ms. Cohen? Yes, I think I touched on it earlier in my conversation, um, and I would like to agree with the with Lloyd and Ian about the supply chain. I don't expect that food will be short. Um, there are supplies 
in, in all kinds of, we have to be resourceful, resourceful. So yes, we have to find alternative sources for goods. But um, when it relates, as it relates to storing your goods and making sure that you can afford to stock adequately, that's where the challenge will, will come. You have to make sure that you are able to source funds at, uh, at you know, a reasonable rate. I, I suppose persons who have gone public will, will be able to attest to the fact that you have to be able to fund your business adequately in these times. And, and, and if I may interject here, the truth is you, you have to, as an organization, you'll have to look at your working capital and you have to determine what is the mix between inventory and cash and interest costs that you are willing, willing, willing to take on. The fact is um, that's one of the, the things you, you must look at, look at the opportunities. And um, your, your EOQs in terms of your, your, your inventory hold that you, you plan, 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 to have our base on your, your policy position will allow you to determine what levels of inventory that you're holding. And the fact is, in times like these, if you are a, a, a retailer of consumer, you really have no time to be holding beyond a long, longer term, given the fact that many of the factors that influence costs are so uncertain. Well, one of the things I think we need to start considering though as a nation is the, the duty that we pay for goods at the port. Some of the items that we import attract a duty of between 35 and 45% added cost to the value of the goods that we bring in. When you factor the rate of exchange and the cost at the source that has gone up, it may be time for us to look, and I know that this is going to be a controversial topic, but it may be time for us to revisit that those rates, especially as it relates to the consumer who is really having a hard time out there. So I know that our, our, our financiers and our, our wizards out there need to figure out how to fund our economy, but there is a pivotal point that we need to consider where our consumers are really having it hard. And we need to look at the duty that we pay for goods and what it is causing, the pain and suffering that is causing. So while we have to fund the government and we have to fund the things that we know we need, we need to look at the cost of goods and how it is affected by these duties. Customs can tell you, I'm sure they've gotten far more than they expected over the last few years. And they've boasted about it because it is a source of income for economy. But we need to look at it in these very difficult times. We need to consider whether or not we can look at reducing the cost of the duty at the port. All right, very good. Um, very interesting discussions. And I'm seeing where uh, Mr. Edmund Marsh is rearing to come into the discussion here. You can go ahead for me, Sir Marsh. Well, um, well Dr. Johnson, Dr. McBean would not um, allow me and Yolanda as well to escape raising the point about um, the whole question about inventory and what levels and so on. And, and yeah, we know nowadays where we're talking about just in case and so on and resilience. But part of it now is to look at how do we manage data? How are we can help to you know, improve our, our forecasting or our data analytics and all of that or modeling. Now it's time where, you know, place like you know, this MSBM comes in, in a, in a sense of helping to train and develop the, 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 the skills and, uh, you know, capitalizing on the experience of individuals by offering them, you know, a, a framework to improve on the training and development aspect. So things like, as I said, you know, the modeling, um, you know, the technologies that are around to help to improve on forecasting and so on. You know, now it's time that we have to engage in, in more scientific and professional way to, to manage our business. So, you know, I know Ian and Andrew are doing, you know, tremendously well in their business and in having to manage this on a day-to-day -day basis, but part of it is also, you know, on the, on the professional side. 
Yes, um, thank, thanks for giving us those perspectives. Very critical there, uh, Sir Marsh. And uh, against that background, I, I hear coming out from the discussion as well, a, a critical part is going to be that whole role that supply relations and management um, plays in the supply chain. Um, but as a small state country like Jamaica, what sort of bargaining power or buying power we have to really engage meaningful with some of those suppliers? And I want to put that question to um, uh, Earl Stewart. Give us some perspective on that one, uh, Mr. Stewart. Uh, so before I answer uh, directly, um, the question I posed, um, I'd like to comment on previous points that were raised. I wanted to come in, uh, and I know that I could throw my hand up and, and go. I, I would have dived in. Uh, but just to say that, you know, the statistics I provided earlier on showed at the, the COVID period that year, you know, how things looked. Uh, what are we seeing now with respect to, you know, because I hear the conversation about recovery taking place. We're, we're seeing some reverse in terms of containerized shipment. Um, that is up by 8% with respect to the weights of goods, the volume, that is up by 152%. Um, exports also up in terms of the containerized export by 14%. So definitely, um, with respect to exports, we're seeing where, you know, the, the, the producers of Jamaica, the, the exporters are, are now finding different markets, are, are, see, are healing opportunity, uh, whereby the, 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 the number of exports are, are increasing. Uh, while, of course, we wish it would be greater, but there is some, some, some improvement and some increase there. We're seeing because the question was posed about food shortages as one of the driver for us in terms of our, our recovery from a standpoint of the volume and revenue. Uh, consumable with respect to food based items is, is up there. Normally, it would not be listed as one of the one of the items that, you know, in our top drivers, but we're seeing there. And also to uh, corroborate the point. Um, that Lloyd Distant made with respect to persons, we're seeing it in the data where persons are, uh, you know, looking to other markets, if I might call it, or other countries such as Mexico to import stuff, which, you know, of course is reducing the overall uh, cost as is with respect to the limited freight. So on, on, the, on the freight point, you know, while, while, while not trying to go there, but still maintaining transparency, um, you know, that's one of our core values of, of customs. We are seeing in the data that, you know, with respect to the tax base, uh, the, the charges for freight, there's a 2% incre increase. So we've seen it move from 5% to now 7%, 7% uh, insurance moving from 2% from to 3%. So while, 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 while not going down the road that, you know, broad brushing the thing that, you know, you know, Freight rates are crazy, or it's going wild. You know, we're saying that there, we, we have seen some amount of some amount of in, in, increase. Uh, on the point of you know where the duties and taxes are concerned, I know persons love to look to customs, but persons should be reminded that you know there's a tax policy unit at the Ministry of Finance and the Public Service, and it's from that level where you know the discussion surrounding tax rates. Are, are, are concerned. So the interventions should really be pointed there. Customs on the other hand, you know, we're, 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 we're an enforcement agency with respect to not just border protection, but respect to policies and procedures that are implemented. So you, the question you posed about, you know, the bargaining power for, you know, companies here in Jamaica. We, we I believe that we have an upper, upper hand. We, we, we're, strongly on, on the stronger side an importing country so you know we we purchase a lot um we import a lot from overseas and you know if if, if we're seen if a company is seen as you know jamaica is a, a niche market for a particular supplier then 
it gives you, you know, some amount of leverage whereby, you know, you, you can negotiate um, with respect to items. But I think the point made with respect to, you know, not just looking to the, the, the Asian market, but to look to other opportunities with respect to, you know, other Caribbean or other regional countries, uh, be it in Latin America to, to source goods. Uh, that's something, an opportunity that companies should be looking for at this time. All right, thank you very much. Uh, one more comment on this question, then I, I'm seeing a number of other questions coming in the chat. And we have a, a very short window to feel as many of them as possible. So I'm going to give uh, Lloyd Distance the final say on this question. Thanks again, Lanny. I, uh, there's one point I'm going to put in the chat because I'd love to hear from persons like Ian and others about the, you know, when we speak about holding stock, Ian went straight to the, to the heart of it, which is a, around, uh, you know, you're managing your cash flow. And in the engagements we have with the Bankers Association, they're saying that they're doing everything in their power to help their customers to manage cash flow and they're putting options on the table. Um, not for answering right now, but maybe at some point in time, if time, if time allows, Lanny, we might allow them to answer that. Uh, yeah. In response to the particular point that we're on, though, I'd like to throw something out to Earl. Uh, I know this shipping association and several of us, other private sector organizations, the, the chamber inclusive, had penned a thought that said, look, the... This increase in shipping rates that we're seeing are, is having a deleterious impact on CIF charges for those persons who are importing. Why would we not? Because the CIF is is uh, is calculated based on the shipping charges yeah. as well. Yes. Yeah, could, yeah. could the government not say, you know what? It's it's gone up to twenty thousand, but. We used to, people used to pay three thousand five hundred, four thousand. Yes, yes. Why not just continue using the four thousand figure? And Earl, don't tell me it's above your pay grade. Um, and, but we're trying to be creative here to help yes. both the importing and exporting businesses. Um, could could something like that work? That's that's the only question for you. I know you're not the minister of finance. I'm just throwing it out to you. So. Uh, like, let, no, let us peg it. Let us peg it. Yes. So like, you know, that, that's exactly where my response was going to go in, to say, you know, I, 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 I can't speak for the minister, neither can I speak for tax, tax policy. Um, as customs, we would have done our analysis, uh, looking at the data, and of course, we would have made our submission uh, to, to the ministry on the point and and then it's for the, the 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 minister and you know is supporting staff that that looks at these things and makes a decision in the in the in the, the best what i consider the best economic uh, uh decision for the country and uh, you, you would have heard the minister say that this time it is not feasible uh to such and um I'll take you off the hot spot early. I'll take you off the hot spot early. You're ahead of you're ahead of targets. You're ahead of targets. I'll take you off the hot spot. You know, you know, Lloyd. You know, Lloyd. It is serious though. It is serious that that's something needs to be looked at. The fact is, and I can cite examples. One of our company within our group is a manufacturing company. And when our manufacturing base has increased by 100% for just cost without including freight would have moved from 2,000 per container to about 18,000 per container. Look at the multi, plus there is a nine to 12% foreign exchange devaluation that comes into being with that. Look at the, the multiply effect that that will have on the country itself. It's a, I think it is time that we need to remove the whole issue of hiding, hiding behind a veil and to look at the real impact that these are having on the Jamaican public yeah, rather yeah, than a small but, segment. Uh, just, just before, we, we, I know this is a very exciting um, question um, and it, the discourse is going to be... <laughs> yeah, I just want to give you something to think about. Yes. Yeah, you, you mentioned you mentioned manufacturing and you know 
but but have they been given thought to the 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 the, the amount of respect to tax expenditure and relief that manufacturers um, benefit from. Because yes, you look at the CIF value for a manufacturer, but with respect to the relief, the tax expenditures, you know, what person called waivers or incentives, I mean, they're not paying those duties and taxes and such forth. So um, I, I'm, I, I'm thinking you now really what is the real impact uh, on, on a manufacturer and, and, mm -hmm. and I guess, it lends itself to where that um, Sir Marsh mentioned with respect to the need now for you know the, those data analytics and stuff to really you know come up with the empirical evidence to talk about the impact really. Remember the omnibus. Mm -hmm. You know, early time. You notice that this sparked a lot of interest the conversation. You know, everybody directed their venom to you, but it is it's time. For us to have a, a practical conversation about the cost to the consumer exactly. when we add the duty at the court. Exactly. We have the credit, the insurance, we have all of these other things. The rate of exchange is sliding, you know, constantly. Yes. I, I, I I, I, I'm sure, that. I'm sure, um, Sir, Sir Stewart um, is going to be taking some recommendation because this is a very um interesting yeah. one and i think it, it it's cause for us to continue the dialogue absolutely uh, some very serious dialogue so i'm sure he's going to take the recommendation to the relevant person that yes. can then yes. escalate same to the powers that be and i'm not negating the discussion that it needs to be had yeah. because i'm a consumer yeah. I'm a consumer so, yeah, man. so to follow to follow that that question I, i'm seeing one in the chat here where it's speaking to the whole movement of the cost in the container, free charges. And the question is asked by Peter, let me just see if I can shorten that. If we are seeing in the near future, um, any um, going back to pre-pandemic um, costs in terms of freight, all right? Um, or is there gonna be a persistent in this new norm? All right? Um, uh, I want to ask our consultant, um, Mr. Marsh, could you share any perspective, you know, especially working in the Port Authority? Um, do you see what's the outlook in terms of this going back to pre-pandemic or normalization we are expecting with these new costs? Well, um, listen, I'm retired now, right? Over a year, so I no longer can speak on behalf of the Port Authority. You'd have to to maybe make um, some, you know, speak to them. But from what we're seeing, the near future, there's, don't expect a lot of changes in the near future. They, they, they overhang or the changes I mentioned, people are looking at 24 to 36 months before you really see, you know, and, it, and, it, and it's significant um, normalization than if it were. But, you know, the fact is a lot, a lot of it, you know, relies on demand and supply and, when there's some more semblance and when some of the bottlenecks have been removed, then you will see some normality restoring. But for the time being, the bottlenecks are just, just um, difficult to overcome. You see how difficult they, 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 they force in, you know, big country like the US having problems clearing backlogs uh, at, at, at their port. I mean, for all ports, you know, the, the good thing about, and, um, our customs friend will tell you that we have been very resilient. We have not really had any, any major um, disruption to this point of you know backlogs and long lines of, of vessels there. So that part is not a, a big issue for us, but, it, but because of this globalized environment we are operating in, then we're seeing those effects. And it's not likely to change in the near future, in my view. Nice, thanks for that input there. Um... Dr. Mr. Marsh. No, don't. Uh, <laughs> based on what I'm seeing here, you know, uh, we are getting very close to the end of the question and answer session. Uh, I'm not sure, too sure if the powers that we can indulge us a little more with an additional 10 minutes to just wrap this up. Um, but some very interesting um, discussions. And I think with that outlook that Mr. Marsh mentioned about free costs maybe another 24, 36 months. It therefore means then, Sir Stewart and team, that we need to have some very 
um, serious discussion about this whole thing of the valuation as it relates to freight costs. But I'm, I'm seeing another important question here in the chat. It says, is Jamaica still on track to become a major logistics node in the Americas? And uh, sir, distance, you would have sit in a very peculiar position, um, uh, maybe in some of those discussions. Could you share some perspective um, on that question? Uh, the, the quick answer I would give is no, we are not on track. However, the op opportunity still exists. Uh, for us to be there, there are a number of things that need to be put in place. And, and certainly the work that's being done by the, the special, the SEZ, uh, the SEZ is the Special Economic Zones Entity as well as many others will, posi they will position some aspects of it. Uh, obviously as well, the work that's the expansion that continues by the port terminal that will of course create opportunities. Um, but for us to take fulsome advantage of our positioning in the region, there are a lot of moving parts that we've just uh, as Jamaican entities and as business people, we're just not wrapped our head around putting these things in place, investments that are necessary and the role that each uh, person, each entity needs to play. So long and short of it, the opportunity, I believe, still exists for us, uh, but we are not, we have not advanced implementation at the pace that we could. Thanks much for that. So there are some work to be done. And I'm seeing another very important question here. Uh, it says Jamaica latest inflation figures have mainly reflected <laughs> domestic agricultural prices and transportation prices. So increases have been happening in those fronts. And the question is, if we have seen the full blunt of price increases caused by shipping um, issues, or is there others to come? I want to put that question to our CFO, Ian Kelly, you want to just feel that question for us? So are we to, to brace for more price increases or we have seen the full brunt caused by these shipping disturbance? I, I think it's a continuous, we're going to see continuous price increasing given the fact that one, uh, we continue to feel the effects of the devaluation of the exchange rate of the Jamaican dollar to the functional currencies. We, see many price increases, not only in freight, freight rates, but also in the base prices of goods. And as a result of that, uh, many co companies will, will have resorted to even taking smaller margin will have to pass on some to the consumers. And, and that is what you are seeing. And we expect to see that as, as, as these, these base, base issues continues. All right, thanks much for that feedback. Sir Kelly, uh, I'm seeing a, another question. I think we have spoken to it to some regard, but I think there's another spin to it. The question speaks to the disruption in the supply chain caused by the pandemic and what adjustment, if any, are being made in terms of how we manage our inventory. All right. And the, the question is if um, adjustments are made, are, are these with the view? Um, in terms of long-term changes. Um, I know from a, a distributor perspective, I want to just follow up with you, Sir Kelly, on this. Um, could you give us some perspective uh, on that? Um, uh, what, what sort of adjustment um, can we make in terms of how we manage the inventory? What have you been doing uh, as a, a business guru um, in terms of this aspect? Um, importantly, you will have to be planning, you have to use technology, and you have to use the brains of your employees within, within your organization and data in order to, 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 to look at what you must do within this time in order to keep your operation going at, at a particular tolerable limit, as well as to ensuring that you know your consumers are always satisfied with what you're, you have set out to achieve. So the fact is, this is where you'll have to, we, are, we at Derman or within the Derman group have to be balancing the issue of cash flow with 
the levels of EOQs, um, how much you're going to tie up, where, where you're going to tie up your funds, how you're going to manage that working capital, capital. and, and um, the, the use, what we have seen, technology and data plus the relationships is what we use um, um, on a, on, at the top of the table in order to make that this is these decisions and surely we have been making that decision hence the reason why even during the pandemic we have been doing doing relatively well in terms of what we offer to our business in all the different areas within the group okay great so time is on us i'm seeing where there is a lot more feedback and question and uh, the committee members, by the way, don't think that you are left hanging. We will find a way how to respond to those questions, if not tonight, uh, and share those with you. Um, just to, to wrap up this session, though, and to get some final perspective from our panelists. So we are hearing the whole thing of that we need to have resilient um, supply chain, diversifying our supply chain, managing our risk, um, etc. Um, I want to close with this final question. So looking ahead, you know, uh, in terms of what is the next normal? So we're now at the new normal um, team. So looking ahead, what could be the next normal um, be for supply chain and logistics? And what role will technology play in that effort? So I want to just get the quick round feedback on the from the team as we close this session in another two minutes, all right? So we want to, again, start with the rose among us. So Lady Cohen, you want to just share your perspective. So looking ahead, what, what is the next normal in terms of supply chain and logistics and, and what role will, will technology play, if any, from your perspective? I think, um, thank you for, for, for that, Lani. I think we've started to see it already um, online shopping is is the way of the future the challenge that purchasing online presents to us all is that um you need to make sure you deliver what you promise and that is where and blossom mentioned it earlier um persons are selling goods that they don't have in stock persons are um not delivering what is promised and so of course that now brings into question the entity that is proposing to, to do these sales. So we have to, to drill down into our own delivery and ensure that when we promise to deliver goods, we do it with integrity and that we honor our commitments, of course, with the challenges in the logistics and the, the supply chain, it makes it much harder for us to do all of these things that we, we need to do. You have to be resourceful, you have to have adequate funding, and you have to be very, very creative with your delivery processes. So it, it, it all goes well if you can pivot and deliver what you commit to, to deliver in a timely manner. But um, yeah, there is, there is room for growth if you can do all of those things efficiently. Good. Thanks much. So another 30 seconds, um, Lloyd Distance, any final perspective here? 30 seconds as a wrap. Uh, thanks again, Lani and all. You, I've been pondering from you asked that question about what this, I mean, we almost feel like we're in the new norm, so trying to think ahead has become quite, think too far ahead has become quite difficult. Uh, I believe that we, certainly several points made by Andrea are exactly where we now need to be thinking, how we utilize technology more to, utilize more technology to create additional efficiency. The per people and entities who were thinking flexibly and thinking uh, identifying innovative solutions or ways to deliver products will make the biggest difference uh, going forward. All or right, will be good. the most successful going forward. Thanks for that feedback. Edmund Marsh, any perspective as we close? 30 seconds. Just quick. Yeah, they are. Um, well, I must say I'm heartened, even though, you know, we have been talking about a lot of doom and gloom. I'm, part, I'm involved, for example, in an investor who is looking to invest over $350 million in Jamaica in, 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 in a particular industry that is all geared towards export, development of intermediate 
using our natural resources. So I'm hopeful. Um, technology, of course, we mentioned, was mentioned. Risk management, more, more effort at, at managing risk. I mean, yeah, we have all learned that coming out of the pandemic, right? Uh, resilience and so on is a new type of guidance. Sustainability, you know, another form of this resilience which we have to be looking at. The world is, is changing with the climate change and all the, the, these. Um, so we have to be looking at industries that can um, provide that level of protecting the future of all, you know. So I'm, 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 I'm optimistic, even though there is a lot of talk about, you know, there's significant price increases, innovativeness yes. and all of this and resilience yes. will, will come forward. All right, thanks. Thanks for that feedback, Sir Marsh. And uh, two last before we wrap here, um, uh, the gentleman from Jamaica Customs, uh, very, very useful discussions here. Um, Sir Stewart, any perspective um, as we close this session? 30 seconds. Sir, man, I'll try to be quick. Um, five points. One, data analytics and risk management. Uh, it's time for both government public private sector to, to recognize the need to use data in, in decision making. Um, that's how you're gonna have your, get your competitive advantage and that's how you're gonna improve your services. Two, business process improvement, re-engineering and integration. You know, private sector need to look as to how do I integrate my processes with state run agencies, with, with other private sector to create simplification of the processes. Three, digitalized processes, leverage technology, right? No, nobody wants to be running from ear to ear anymore. We all want to stay at home, sit in our office and get business done. And that's the reason why e-commerce is boom, taking off in Jamaica that much. We have seen um, growth in terms of the volume of trade by e-commerce. Time all alone to get into the numbers, but we have seen it. Uh, stakeholder satisfaction and experience. So, and definitely companies now need to look, as, as, as Ms. Kwanak said, how do we satisfy yes. our stakeholder? How do we meet the needs, the needs, not just the wants, but the needs of the stakeholder. And the final thing, business sustainability and continuity. Definitely COVID-19 has shown us that we, you know, pivot all kind of terms come up during this time. Yes. That really shows is how do we ensure that we have business continuity from a public right. sector and from private sector. Good. All right. Thanks much for that. And the last 30 seconds is Mr. Kelly's. Well, well right. at least, well, I, I, I share many of the points that Earl spoke to. Uh, data analy analytics, analytics, digitization and technology, innovation, partnerships between the various stakeholders and business, business risk management and business continuity. I think if we coordinate all of those factors, we will be, be, be a better, better, better country and organization going forward. Great. Thanks very much. I think we accomplish a lot in terms of looking at some of the important elements of the mute point that we were discussing. And we want to say thanks to all the panelists all right, for taking the time to share of your expertise and your knowledge. And thanks to the audience in virtual world who posed some very um, intriguing questions. And the questions that we weren't able to, to go to, we will definitely make some time to look at those as we go on. And uh, thanks also to the coordinators for giving us the additional time um, to go through this session. So as our keynote speaker closed in her presentation, that we must think possibility, very profound. And I want to end there. Thanks much. Thank you very much, Lani. The, the excitement is palpable. We've seen it in the questioning. We already know there's a demand for part two. And I'm sure that something will happen which is going to make this possible. But we must not forget that uh, some of in our, in our audience are also from time zones which are not our time zones. And this brings me to a brief foray into introducing uh, Gianni de Alwis, who is the global chairperson of Willat. And I think she has something to say to us, which hopefully will cause our energies even to go to higher levels. Let's welcome. Welcome to Jamaica, Gianni.
Thank you so much, Franklin. Uh, you know, it's really, really illuminating and exciting. I learned a lot about your part of the world. And I woke up very early today because I wanted to listen to the challenges that uh, are being experienced by uh, your part of the world. And it's actually no different to what we are experiencing in Sri Lanka as well. So uh, let me first, be, uh, my, my uh, uh, brief that was given to me is just to give an introduction about Willat. I know, Franklin, when you uh, started off, explain to everybody about uh, what Willat is, but I think uh, I would like to, just to give a quick brief uh, overview of who we are and what we do, uh, and then uh, you will also be very excited to join us. Uh, so good day to all of you. For you, it's the end of the day. And for me, I'm just starting, uh, starting a new day. So thank you very much for inviting me. I am Gaini Dialvis, the Global Chairperson uh, of Women in Logistics and Transport. And I'm really congratulating Blossom, our very young Willat country, which was uh, inducted uh, to our family a few months ago, and already they've started organizing a webinar. So in the customary Sri Lankan uh, style, I'm based in Sri Lanka. Are you Bowan? Are you Bowan meaning, may you live long life. That's very important in a pandemic time. So thank you very much once again. So who are we? You know, as Franklin mentioned as well, we are a forum in CILT and we are the women's group of CILT and our Main objective is also same as uh, CILT to promote the art and science of logistics and transport. So as women, we want to promote the status of women in supply chain logistics and transport. But I must uh, tell you, I mean, I'm sure all of you know, as per the latest global gender gap report of 2021, uh, you know, Jamaica is placed 40 out of 156 countries and you have already reached the gender gap by 74%. So you have only 26% to go. The highest, the number one country is Iceland who have bridged the gap by 89%. So you're very at the top. And also another heartening point is Barbados is ahead of you, 27 out of 156. So which shows the Caribbean, all of you are marching forward and ahead of all of us and my home country we are still reeling behind 116 out of 156. So with that positive note I would like to say you are in the right place and women in the Caribbean are really marching forward ahead of the rest of the world ahead of the some of our countries in the Villat family. Having said that the top 10 countries are Rwanda and Namibia where we have CILG presence. So, however, if you look at our industry, our industry is considered to be male dominant, all of you know that, and very few women are there, and I don't have statistics about women in, in your country, uh, in, the, in logistics and transport, globally I know it's around 3%. So we have a, a huge role to play in that. So we in women uh, realized that in way back in 2010, and then we uh, discussed with CILT and we said we need to have a women's forum. And with that, we identified our own logo because we felt our W is actually similar to the birds formation, flying formation of birds. So birds are normally gregarious. You know, they work in teams, go together, fly together. They are leaders, they take turns to lead and they like freedom. So we. As women, we do things in a very passionate way, like the way already Blossom and her team have started. So globally, our vision is to be the most sought after for advocacy, professionalism, and empowerment of women in our industry. So I'm glad that you have engaged the industry, not only the industry, the government agencies like customs, the chambers, all that, because all of us are part of the whole ecosystem. We need to engage everybody and promote professionalism and having more gender diverse industry. So our mission is this to promote the status of women in our sector so that we bring together all those women uh, to support their talent development, career development, uh, and through our various networking and mentoring opportunities like the webinar that you have organized today, we had 90 plus 
and so encouraged to see 80 odd, uh, 80 something was there, even now 70 participants still there. So that's a very good sign. And congratulations to the team who organized this because it's very important to get the message across to the masses. So we in Vilad, what do we do? We inspire young women, you know, strive more and demand more from the industry. We empower women because we want to promote the role of women in our industry. And we advise through our global network, we, through our CILT and Vilat network, we have a huge group of 36,000 professionals and out of that 3,600 are women, right? So we educated because we CILT has a world-class educational platform and Mona Business School is an accredited education provider. So we have these professional uh, education programs, which is which we are making our leaders future ready with 21st century attitudes. We aspire to create a diversified industry through our activity. We want our uh, industry and our country's economy, the various activities that we do to be in an equal society. And finally, whatever we do, we need to make a difference to the lives of our women, men and the whole country through our vision realization. So if you look at our global footprint, we are now present in 32 branches with over 3,268 members. So our first branch, as I mentioned to you, was set up in 2010 in Nigeria. And the newest member was Rwanda. You will see our very first uh, Vilat is in, in, in Caribbean, the 31st country, right? So we are happy to induct you and we want more countries to join. So I'm also in discussion with Guyana, North America also has agreed Peru and all that. So we are slowly expanding our footprint uh, in other countries. So we are basically present across the world. We have a strong presence in Asia and Africa. The countries that are in purple are the countries where we have a fully fledged Vilat. These countries in gold are places where we have a contact and we are working with them to set up Vilat. So we have a very crowded global uh, footprint. And this is how we govern us. So as uh, the chairperson, I took over this responsibility last year. I have a deputy who's based in Hong Kong, I'm based in Sri Lanka. These were my past chairpersons, Dorothy, former president, and then our founding president, Aisha from Nigeria. And we have two advisors, one from CILT, one from Vilat. And the whole geography, the global footprint is divided into different regions. And we have nine, global vice chairs responsible for different regions. And under them, they have different countries that they are responsible for. And globally, we look at five, four strategic trusts and also corporate social responsibility. So what we want is to, we, develop, we should develop the leadership qualities of women so that they can take up higher responsibilities and break the so-called elusive glass ceiling. And we want to empower the women uh, not only uh, to work in organization and you know, develop, become entrepreneurs, but we also want them to start their own organizations. I know some of the ladies who are already uh, in our membership already have their own companies. And we also want to mentor them because not many joining our industry because it's considered a male dominant industry. How do we bring in more women into the industry and take them uh, through their career journey and support them? and entrepreneurship as well. So empowerment, entrepreneurship, leadership, mentorship, these are the strategic trusts that we work on it. And also we work on corporate social responsibility. And especially this is a very successful program in Africa where we have a sustainable transportation mode uh, to support women who have mobility uh, problems. And when I took over last year, I undertook these priorities as my uh, mandate for the next uh, the, the three years of my tenure, I wanted to grow members within countries and regions to grow reach across sectors and white spaces because our industry is huge. Uh, in the initial opening remarks, even Franklin mentioned we are present in aviation sector, maritime, land transport, you know, the users, providers, different industries, military, academia, public sector, the whole works. We are a quite a diverse sector industry. So we need to be present in all areas, right? We also need to look at developing partnerships, not only locally, globally as well, already in some countries, 
we have developed partnerships with the uh, USZ, GIZ, and CILT themselves have a, a, a program on transit where they provide scholarships and we have a very successful program in Africa. So you can apply for these things for partnership to for the sustenance of Village and CILT in your own countries. So my uh, focus these, uh, these days is to work with corporates, international companies, the funding agencies to see how we can develop partnerships to globally work so that the countries also will benefit. We also, we are part of CILT, so therefore we need to develop capacity. So driving capacity building, we recently launched a capacity building center for Vilat virtually. And of course, uh, climate change, we are in a climate emergency and the reason uh, COP26, we realize how uh, you know, uh, important this aspect that we need to consider. You know, we need to really make sustainable living a way of life and supply chain is a biggest, one of the biggest contributors for a climate change, greenhouse gas, uh, the, you know, issue, you know, all that. So therefore we need to make sure sustainable living as part of that. I will quickly take you through our journey, as I mentioned to you in 2010 in Malta, idea was, uh, you know, um, the seed was planted. And then in 2011, Australia, because every year we meet in a different country in the CILT family. So in each, each year at the conference, we discuss the issues. So till about 2013, when Villat idea was firmed up by CILT and embraced it. And then in 2013 in Sri Lanka, we launched the global movement of Villat. Since then, we have grown in numbers and last year we added four new countries this year nine so we have added 13 new countries in the past two years i'm really happy i was able to do that despite the pandemic and i remember all of you were saying you know pandemic period you have to consider opportunity this as an opportunity yes it's a crisis situation and virtually actually digitalization and virtual remote working has really helped us to really grow Villat. I mean, the way that I'm linking up with you now is because of the virtual way of working. I think this is a real opportunity for us to engage and network. And there are many different types of activities we do in our, our family. So if you go to our website, you will see, I just listed out a few things that we do globally. So you will, if you are part of us, you will be able to experience this now, mostly in virtual now, and physically, you, if you're present in the country, you can get involved. And we are very imaginative and creative. We have a lot of mementos. Blossom has some of these things, so you can develop your own mementos to promote our identity in your countries. And this is one of the landmark initiatives which we did during the pandemic in June. We launched our capacity building center in line with our CILT professional development mandate as a virtual capacity building center. Why? To develop leadership skills of our women and increase the female talent pool because our industry doesn't have that many number of uh, young women and uh, mid-career women. So therefore through CPD programs, we want to increase that and also develop entrepreneurship skills and also empower women to make an impact to the industry. So this was formally launched. Already we have conducted two programs. The third program was just concluded last week. So this is part of the total uh, CILT uh, program suit. The first program was on leadership. Second program was on sustainability leadership. The third one was on digitalization. And we will be shortly starting coaching and mentoring programs. So we will be very soon sharing our program calendar. And we also have on-demand learning platform. This is, uh, we are actually subscribing to the CILT Singapore program. You can do that. We've got a concessionary rate for VILAC members. So if you're interested, please log into our website and reach out to us. You can actually do that at your own pace. And we also like how you're doing globally, regionally, and at country level, we are conducting programs. And globally, we do every once in two months global webinars. The next program is due in September on the 16th. Very soon, we will be sharing the data with you. And the last one, which we did was on the World Maritime Day uh, uh, to commemorate that about the seafarers and the importance uh, of their role that they play uh, in the maritime industry. And also we uh, do a lot of promoting activities 
uh, through our social media pages in uh, Facebook and LinkedIn page, please visit us, Villa Global. And also last month we launched our very first uh, electronic newsletter. Uh, and uh, please visit our website, www.villa.org. And you could see, and you could see uh, Blossom here in the picture. This is the very first cover page on all the country chairs pictures and where they are located. So please visit that website and do that. And finally, we want to end the year with a celebration. So on the 3rd of December, 12 GMT, I know it's late for you, but we will be organizing a Christmas carol and a fun event. So please do join us. And I hope after listening to this, you got really energized and excited and now wondering what should I do and what will I achieve by being part of us? And these are the benefits that we offer as part of being CILT. You can gain a unique professional qualification with global recognition. You can use globally recognized post nominals. You know, if you're a chartered member, you can uh, use it uh, CMILT. If you're a fellow, you can use FCILT. So that is globally recognized in the 37 countries we are present and a global recognition, right? And we have a huge network of 36,000 members. And you have these networking opportunities and you any problem that you have, any issue that you need, you can reach out to anybody through our network. And also you have job and internship opportunities in the country region globally, and you can reach out to your network to help get help as well. And we have a successful mentoring program, which was initiated by Villa Sri Lanka, which is called Ignite, and that is available for any country who's interested in uh, uh, you know, implementing that. Already five countries have already implemented. And also, as I mentioned to you, there are scholarships, TransAid, uh, and various scholarships that are globally available through CILT, Aspire scholarships for uh, you know, needy students. And you can also apply if you're part of CILT, all these are available for you. And CILT being a professional body, we have this continuing professional development programs and also CILT education programs, which Mona School of Business is part of. So you can always through them attend all these programs and have access to our global programs that we do run virtually if you're a member. And we have a wealth of information and knowledge in our uh, membership as well as in our website, the knowledge forum and all that, you will have access to all this. And finally, we launched our international business forum a few months ago. That is very useful for our corporates. And also they can reach out to uh, any country, uh, uh, you know, corporates and companies on business opportunities, consultancies and all that. So you can reach out to the International Business Forum as well. So I'm sure after listening to this quick presentation, rapid fire presentation about Willat and also CILT, you got a sneak preview of what we do. And I'm sure you are excited to join us. And thank you very much, Blossom and Franklin for inviting me and giving this opportunity. I didn't hesitate whatsoever to wake up very early in the morning because I, I really was excited and I think I'm really, really happy that you did that. And uh, congratulations and all the very best. It was a very successful webinar that you did. Your maiden attempt is very successful. Thank you very much, all the very best. Well, thank you, Ghani. It was great to have you. I would almost say you can now go to bed, but I think it's about time to begin to get up. Yes. So we really appreciate the time you've spent with us. I also am amazed at the energy you've put into your term of office, the expansion in the organization, the garnering of membership on the other side of the globe. You are fabulous. You know, Gani was a logistics professional in one of the big multinational firms. I think it's Unilever. Yes. And um, you can see her enthusiasm must have made waves and caused her to rise. Thank you very much. And I hope all that energy that you have, we will um, cause some kind of a volcanic event so that we'll support Blossom. Sure. And the woman in logistics and transport in the Caribbean to make an equal impact. Thank you. And thank you, Blossom. Um, 
let me not say anymore. It's really so exciting. I'm going to have to ask um, Craig, Craig Peru, to do our closing remarks. Craig is, of course, the president of CILD Caribbean and a, a major project manager and a part of MSBM in his own right. So, Craig, over to you. Closing remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you so much for staying uh, nearly two, uh, we're coming up to two and a quarter hours. Uh, I want to move the vote of thanks uh, and begin with uh, Dr. Blossom Amila Nelson uh, for her erudite and eloquent presentation, which set the intellectual stage for the evening. I think we all agree. It's, it's clear that with her as chairperson, you like Caribbean is clearly in good hands. I want to thank the panelists, uh, Mrs. Andrea Cohen, Mr. Lloyd Diston, Mr. Ian Kelly, Mr. Marsh, Mr. Earl Stewart uh, for their, their insights as, as sentinels of the supply chain and logistics industry in Jamaica. We're especially happy that they were willing to engage in vigorous and civil debates. And I'm confident that the breadth of perspective they shared has left us all better informed than we were at the start of the evening. Uh, our panelists have charged the industry to embrace data analytics and digitalization even more enthusiastically than we have to date. And I think I can say on behalf of both MSPM and CILT Caribbean that we stand ready to respond to this charge tomorrow morning. Mr. Lani Main, we thank for expertly playing the role of moderator, and we look forward to having him as a future panelist. Dr. Yolanda Silvera, we thank for her able introduction of the moderator and the panelists. Mrs. Gayani de Alwes, oh, thank you so much for representing the International We Like Fraternity and blessing us with your presence from Sri Lanka. As, a, as our chairperson, uh, Franklin has just pointed out, uh, you know, Gayani has been extremely supportive in helping get we lacked carbon off the ground and she's proved a reliable partner. I must thank Dr. David McBean, Janice Henlin, Amanda Allen, uh, Annabelle Graham, the MSBM Technology Unit and the entire MSBM team for partnering with CLT Carbon and, help, and helping to make this event a logistical success. And then to Dr. Franklin Johnston, Chairman of CLT Caribbean and our Master of Ceremonies. Thank you, sir. Your mirthful performance this evening suggests that you still harbor a secret desire for a career as a circus master. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, you are audience. Your presence here has been critical to demonstrating our industry's seriousness about transforming Jamaica into a global logistics powerhouse. I, I know I'll get in trouble for mentioning, if I mention the names of some of the eminent audience members, because there are many. Uh, but there is one you will all forgive me for, given the critical nature of her role in our industry. And of course, I'm speaking of our Commissioner of Customs, Mrs. Velma Ricketts Walker. We're very happy that you joined us, Commissioner. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for attending We Like Caribbean's inaugural webinar. CLT Caribbean welcomes your interest, thanks you for your participation, and invites your further interaction with us. Please do send us an email at info at cltcaribbean.org. We look forward to seeing you all soon again. Have yourselves a wonderful evening. Good night, all. <laughs>